All right, Josh Smith here again, live at my Flat 5 studio. Uh, my guest today is just a really, really incredible guitar player and artist, singer, writer. He's put out some really great records, including a very recent one called Spirit Rising, which you should get um, if you don't have it. And, man, I think we first met when I was 18 years old, so you couldn't have been more than 20, I think, in Chicago at the House of Blues. He was on tour with Jeff Healy. Um, and I was playing in the restaurant. You were playing upstairs in the big club at the House of Blues Chicago. Um, anyways, he's coming to us from Los Angeles, California, so we could actually be together, but, you know, we're doing it through the magic of the Internet. But he hails from Canada. Everybody welcome Philip Sace. All right, Josh, so sweet, man. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it today, man. Dude, it's great to have you, man, and it, it kills me that we live in the same town, and I probably see you once every three years, I would say. At, at like a Cadillac Zap event or something like that. Something like that or the Big Potato or something. It's like, you know, we all kind of swim in our own little pools and, and stuff. And every now and then we bump into each other. And uh, that bums me out. It's like we need to get together more. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. Well, let's let's find a way to make it happen after this. After this, uh, I guess it'll be another, what, six to eight months. We'll see what happens. But, uh, you know, that would that would be lovely. I mean, I certainly keep up. Uh, with, with what you've been up to, lots of great things going on your end. So uh, going on on your end. So that's always <laughs> exciting to see and hear about, man. Thanks, man. Same here. I mean, I'm always keeping myself in touch with what's going on with you and always curious and listening, of course, whenever you put out new music, love the new record. So, dude, I've been starting all of these kind of wanting to know everybody's initial story. I'm most interested in how the guitar got put in your hands. I don't come from a musical family. I'm wondering, do you? Did, did anybody in your in your family play? And how did the guitar end up in your hands the first time? Well, yeah, Josh, thanks for asking. So, yeah, you know, both my parents are uh, librarians. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like not what you would think about loud guitar in a house. But, you know, actually, my parents both grew up in London. And, you know, they were in this, London during the 60s. Uh, I was born in Wales. And, um, you know, when, when I was, you know, growing up, um, you know, we, we moved to Canada. So really being a kid in the in the 80s and all that kind of thing, you know, uh, my parents would bring home the coolest records from the library and they would never go back. So, you know, my dad would bring home like everything from Albert Collins to Jimi Hendrix to Stevie Ray Vaughan to uh, Robert Cray and Clapton, you know, you name it. And that's what got played the entire time. And, um, you know, that was sort of my entire upbringing and it continues until this day. I'm still trying to learn from all of those records and all those artists that, uh, you know, get me out of bed every morning, each and every day. Like Freddie King, come on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so how did the guitar end up in your hands? So they're bringing home records. You're, you're lucky that your parents like good music and you were being kind of, you know, indoctrinated with this great stuff. How'd the guitar show up? So, yeah, it was always Ry Pooter and Eric Clapton, George Harrison, these guys, right? Stevie Ray, they were like the, the top. Jeff Healy, they were the tops in the house when I was a kid. And so naturally i just gravitated to want to learn how to play you know i played uh classical conservatory uh royal conservatory piano for a really long time maybe 10 years um maybe longer than that even and you know my heart was never in it you know it's great for tuning your ear for for understanding about all the things that that we that we think about when it comes to whether it's arrangements or whether it's dynamics or you know wh whatever it is you know i learned a lot of that but the the theory part of it was always a bummer for me i did not enjoy it it didn't, it wasn't fun. And it kind of made, it made some of the practice time actually more of a chore than something where I felt like I was really exploring and coloring in the way that I wanted to. So at school, I also played uh, trombone for like 10 years as well. So I was reading a lot of bass clef, um, which, you know, kind of went hand in hand with the, the classical piano, but neither were really, you know, like that was time of like, we'll get you out of bed in the morning. You know, the trombone was not getting me out of bed in the morning. So it's kind of like, <laughs> Man, I always, always, always wanted to play. And so, you know, when I was about 15, I, I got enough nerve, about 15 or 16, to ask my parents for a, an acoustic guitar. And they, they did. We went to Sears and got one of these ones that was like, I don't know, it was like, you know, 90 bucks. But it had strings like this far, you know, off the neck and, yeah. you know, just got to work from there. So I'm, I'm thankful that my parents were always, they're like, cool, if that makes you happy, then go do that. All right, that's cool, man. So did you did you get a book? Did you start teaching yourself stuff? Did you have anybody to kind of give you little tips or, or did lessons happen right away? 
No, I didn't take any lessons. You know, I just, uh, you know, what I would do at the time was take every VHS tape, every DVD, every cassette, every, you know, whatever we had to listen to and just press rewind, just press rewind, just press rewind. And then, you know, somebody might say, dude, here, I slowed down this one tape of this Eric Johnson thing. You got to check it. You know, so it'd be that sort of thing. And then eventually I realized that, oh, there's this thing called tablature. So, you know, I would look at that a little bit, but mostly it was watching people and watching what, you know, what they were doing. And, and you know, it was, I just wasn't turned on by like scales. I wasn't turned on by the theory of it. I was turned on by like, what can I discover? And so that was really the, that was really the, the whole thing with it. Just kind of like stay in the, you know, just color with all the colors or one of them or none of them. I, mean, I just don't like rules in the music. So, so yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of the story of it. Wow. And did, so did you have friends your age that played anybody you hung out with and, and talked this stuff with? So, you know, thanks for asking. Yeah, my, my best friend growing up in, in high school, my buddy Cassius, uh, he picked up drums around the same time and we learned how to play together in his parents' basement, just him and I, and we just played for weeks, hours, months, years. It was crazy. So that was really, you know, and other friends, of course, it's cool. We're, we're into it too. We're playing. And, but Cassius and I really got down. Um, and actually, we ended up both playing in Jeff Healy's band together. So it was, uh, it was a sweet thing. But uh, yeah, he and I spent a lot of time, a lot of tears, a lot of laughs, a lot of that together, for sure, learning. Yeah, that's, well, that's cool that you had somebody your age that liked the music you liked and was, you know, because we get obsessive when you, when you fall in love with something like, you know, this instrument. It could take over your whole life, and it's very insular sometimes. Like for me, I didn't have anybody my age to hang out with, so it was always adults and, and this and that. So that's cool that you had, you know, somebody your age to spend the time with and kind of just relate to. Yeah, and I'm grateful. He's also like such a beautiful person, you know, like I love the guy. And, and so, you know, uh, it, it, uh, it made it all that much better, you know, just that, that we really connect on that, on that soul front, you know. But, uh, yeah. but yeah, I learned a lot from him, and I'm grateful for that. Nice. So in, in high school then, did you stop playing trombone or did you continue playing through high school in, in band and things like that? Yeah, you know, I played through, I was like playing in the uh, stage band or whatever, you know, like playing in the school band, stage band. And then um, and then I started playing guitar and then I was able to play guitar in the stage band, which was fun. Okay. Um, yeah. I didn't know how to read any of the music, so I just kind of like, I just, you know, tried to try to keep up. <laughs> But uh, but it was fun. I got to take a couple of guitar solos and and learn in that way too. But I was pretty green at the time, so right, man. But even just like that little amount of get, I remember the feeling of getting to bring a guitar to school and getting to use it at some in some way at school was like even reaffirming, like man, this is the greatest. You know, it was like I could do it at school, I could do it at home, I could do it with my friends. Yeah, so it's nice that there was you know it's not a thing anymore really. So, you know, back then there was so much more music in school. I, you know, you're absolutely right. I, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a shame and a sin what has happened in terms of music in schools. But we'll, we'll talk about that another day. But, um, but yeah, did you, you grew up in, in Florida, right? Yeah, I grew up in South Florida, Fort Lauderdale, uh, you know, down yeah. in Miami. And, you know, I had music. I mean, I can remember vividly in elementary school. So I started playing guitar when I was six. So I remember in elementary school we had music class you know two days a week three days a week and there was a dedicated music teacher at my elementary school and then she did a ukulele club that met once a week and i i was in the ukulele club and she cool. found out i played guitar so i became like the leader of the ukulele group you know like nice. i would play guitar and we would all play you know green sleeves or whatever and yeah i mean it was always in middle school same thing i was a lot of music and then high school i went to a performing arts school so there I, I played guitar every that was the, I went to that school on purpose and played guitar every day. I had jazz band, rock band, theory classes, music business classes, all sorts of shit like that. Oh, that's great. That's great. So you were getting to play all day every day. That's that's awesome. Yeah, I'd play at school. I'd go home. I'd play all day. And then, you know, once high school hit, then I was playing gigs at night, at least on the weekends. So I was playing all, you know, all the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Well, that's. That's how you get it done. That's how you get to play like Josh Smith is, is well, work hard and play a lot, man. Well, I mean, so you, you, I mean, I'm assuming like me, you, you became obsessed and you put every minute you could into it just cause you loved it. So you progressed really fast. So what was like the next outlet? When, when did gigs start to become a thing? When did you get out and start playing in front of people? Yeah. You know, I, so I started playing guitar around the time I was 15 and then I was getting out in front of people when I was about 16. So 
there was about a year there um, of, of, you know, first year certainly playing this impossible to play uh, uh, acoustic guitar, right? Like it was like right. super difficult to play. And, you know, every, everybody that I would see playing, I would try to incorporate something. And I didn't even know there was like a string gauge situation yet. You know, all these things you learn as you go. I didn't know you could refret a guitar. I didn't. So, you know, you're like, why is this so hard? So you start learning things as you're going. And, um, but yeah, so I started like sitting in at some clubs, like jam nights, um, when I was about 16 and then started with a band when I was in high school, these, there were some guys that were like on the Toronto circuit and they were playing some originals and some covers. And so I really got to dive into the deep end when I was about, yeah, I guess about 17 with his band. And we played a lot like, you know, nightclubs and, you know, you show up for, um, for high school, you know, show up for school the next morning, you're just asleep on the desk, you know, not, not, a, not a good look, but you know, um, you, as you said, you know, you get the, you get the, the fever for it. You just got to go, you know, and, and, yeah. you know, I was playing with these guys who had had a lot of experience and they liked me and I was like, okay, cool. You know, okay, well I can, I can hang with you guys. Okay. This is great. What do I do here? And I just tried to listen, learn, and, and just be a sponge in that, in that scenario. Yeah. So that, that's where you, you know, had this ability to start growing so fast because you were working on all this stuff, you know, in your own time. And then you got to take it straight to a gig and get on stage and you grow so quickly then like literally every week you're, you're better tenfold. Well, that, that's the, that's the intention. You know, I, <laughs> I don't know if it, some, some weeks were like, what, you know, what was that? But I, I totally hear you. I mean, she's just like, so hungry to, to just sponge up and learn, you know, as much as you can. And, and, you know, in Toronto, you know, we, of course, you know, I mean, I'm an American citizen. I've lived here for a long time. Um, but one thing that's really interesting, not a lot of people are fully aware of South of the border of what's going on, what time it is in Toronto. And I will tell you that there are the baddest, heaviest cats up there, but people don't really know because we look here. We look only here a lot of times, right? And what's in front of us. You know, people, if they saw Kevin Bright play in front of them, they wouldn't know whether to shit or go blind. You know, it's, yeah. there, there are players up there. There was a guy named Michael Keith that I used to look up to a lot when I was getting started. And, man, what a, what a phenomenal player. You know, I mean, just Don Ross, like all kinds of different cats that, that you know, I don't know if it's because the winter was so long, um, <laughs> you know, that, that people just, like, stayed in and, and got really, really, really scary. But... You know, you even have people that, that ended up there who were, you know, guys from the South, real badass players like Pat Rush, who I met, he was playing a lot with, with Jeff Healy around the time when I was around there. And, uh, but he used to play with Johnny Winter. He used to hang with some of the Allman brothers. I mean, these are, these are like real, real heavy players. And uh, so I always enjoy that. There's a little bit of a secret sometimes up there. Because I don't know if it's like, oh, it's Canada. Oh, yeah, it must be good. All right. And then they see them play and they go, holy shit. You know, so that's that's one of the things I dig about some of the Canadian players. They don't really toot their own horn all that much, but if you go see them, it's over. <laughs> nice, yeah. yeah. Well, that that's a that's a brings up a subject I think gets overlooked sometimes is, you know, and you're talking about world class players, but there's also those local guys that you meet and become friends with who are influences on our playing who never get mentioned ever again in, in the magazine interviews and, you know, never played a big gig in their life, never did anything, but like can have equal amounts of importance on what ends up being our playing just because we're around them all the time and we see them and you learn like, you know, how to be a professional, how to be, you know, on time and things like that. This guy's a real working man. And there's so many guys I grew up, you know, being around that fit that description who were uh, had a huge impact on my playing. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Like the guys that were, you know, it's a Dire Straits song that I think it was called Local Hero. You know, it's yeah. sort of like somebody who is deeply respected within the community and is a world class talent for whatever reason is not necessarily well known outside of their community, but it doesn't mean they're any less of a talent, you know. And I mean, I think about um, somebody just popped into mind was Mel Brown, who used to live up in, in southern Ontario. And I mean, good God. <laughs> I mean, it's over. You know? yeah. So, yeah. so having an opportunity to, to meet someone like Mel Brown when I was first getting started and, you know, um, and someone who was so, he was so humble too, you know, like he wasn't, he I don't think he ever said, yeah, I played with Albert Collins on those records. You know, like it was right. none of that. He was just like, I'm Mel Brown. And you knew it was something mysterious about this man. And when he played guitar or organ or whatever he did, it was next level. So, um, 
but yeah, I mean, there were other players, a guy named Mike McDonald in Toronto that I really look up to. One of the smoothest players I've ever seen. I would say as smooth as, as Clapton in the silky vibrato world. Like, just got it. He's got it. Singing. Yeah. So I hear, I totally agree with you. Nice, man. All right. So you're, you're playing gigs and you get, you're starting to get towards the end of high school. What do your parents think? Cause I'm sure at this point you've made the decision. Oh, this is my life. This is what I'm going to do forever. Is there any sort of, uh, you know, bartering with your parents about college or anything like that? How do you explain to them, you know, you're about to dive into this full force? Yeah, man, I, I'm sure, I, I'd love to hear what your situation was like there too. But, you know, it, my parents were pretty cool for the most part. You know, I think by the time I was about 18 or 19 and we're getting really serious into it, because um, in Canada, we had grade 13, right? So you get the extra, I don't think they have it anymore, but they had it up until a few years back. So, um, so you know, you're, you're closer to 18 or 19 when you graduate, and I was definitely playing a lot. And right around that time, um, I happened to sign with a, a label that was affiliated, they were called Hypnotic, and they were part of Universal, I believe, MCA, whatever they were at the time. You know, all these things have folded so many times yeah. over. And um, But, um, you know, that was a, a, something that was really excited about because it was a band called Big Sugar who was out of Toronto that, um, or out of the Ontario area that I really liked, and they were on this label. So I thought, all right, cool, let's try it. So I think around that time, you know, when, when there started being some, some different things started coming in, and right around that time, I connected with Jeff Healy as well. And so that thing sort of, sort of started, started moving, and, and, um, and I'm deeply grateful for that. And, and uh, so they were never worried about you having a backup plan or something like that? Well, you know, I'm sure they were, you know, like there's, as a musician, you know, there's good days and there's, there's good months and bad months. And, and I'm sure that, you know, they saw both, both ends of the spectrum for me, you know, like if I was up or down, but um, I think really they knew that I loved it so much. There wasn't going to be room for anything else, you know, and I was good at it. You know, I mean, I was a student, I was just only been playing a couple minutes, but I liked it. And, and sometimes it's like, it doesn't matter about, I mean, for me, music is never a competition. It was about, it, it is to this day about, trying to find what, what I'm feeling and maybe if I can express that in some way and if that resonates with someone, my God, that's the biggest, deepest compliment I can think of. And if then they were to say, wow, that guy just gave everything he had. Wow, you know, I love to bake. I'm gonna go and make the craziest concoction I've ever made and put that, infuse that into what you love, you know? And that's really what my, what my goal is through, through music. And so I think my parents recognized that I was committed right away. You know, like right away, this is like, okay, well, that's who he is. I think, you know, they never really fought me on it too hard. So I'm grateful for that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm with you on that. I was lucky. That, I, I was lucky. My parents were the, were the same. You know, they, you know, they were always driving me to gigs when I was 12 years old and 13. They knew there was no turning, turning me back, you know, and that this was what I was going to do. Um, and when, yeah. when high school ended, I had already, I mean, we'd been on the road every summer. We'd been, you know, putting out records. It was like, they knew there was, there was nothing else I was going to do. Um, but yeah. they were always, so I was lucky. I mean, my grandparents, they were not happy that I didn't go to college, but my parents uh, were really supportive. Oh, uh, oh, uh, yeah. uh, it's man. hard, man. That's hard. That's a hard one to, to, to I mean, but they must've heard you play and then said like, well, Oh He's yeah, but <laughs> and they would yeah. My grandparents would come to shows and they loved it, but it, it was hard for them to register. You know, like how would I make a living and have a family as a because I wasn't Frank Sinatra, which is what they thought. You know what I mean? You know, you know so it was yeah. like yeah, yeah. yeah they, it was it wasn't something they could quite relate to. So yeah, right. whatever. Right. It worked well, out. Must have been, I, I'm sure that I'm well. I'm sure that you know, wherever they are now and where, where, wherever they've been along during the ride with you, I'm sure they're extraordinarily proud of your accomplishments, man. Oh, thanks, man. I hope so. I hope so. And my, my, I know my parents are, you know, they're, they, you know, I, I'm sure yours do the same. It's like, I can't do anything without seeing my parents, especially during this pandemic, because they're home all the time too. It's like you do 8 million things online. They're always in the, in the chat. Like, oh, there's my dad. Like, really? Come on. <laughs> oh, that's awesome, man. That's so sweet. You know, it's the best thing though, you know, like what a, like what a, what a privilege, what a special gift to be able to have that, you know, to have that family connection through the music, right? That's like, it's timeless. Oh, yeah. It's eternal. It's generational. It's, that's very, very special that, you know, that you have that available. 
Man, and that's an amazing thing about just doing this in general. It's like not many people can relate to like that lightning rod that you have felt or I've felt and all of us feel where it's like, it's like, this is what we're going to do. We've known it since the moment we picked this thing up. Nothing will ever change that. And I mean, there's people that just never have that moment, you know, of, of like divine intervention or whatever, you know, so it's hard. It's such a lucky thing, really. It's, it's, it's like finding, it's finding true love, you know, and it's a, it's a real blessing. It's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's a, it's a work in progress. You know, I don't want to speak for you or for anyone else, but you know, for me, it's a work in progress every day of my life. I, and I'm looking forward to each day to trying to refine and get better and refine and learn. And just, that's, that's it. It's, it's a privilege to make music in, in my lifetime. And I, and I really am grateful for the opportunity. Oh, dude, a hundred percent. I mean, the, one of the questions uh, in the 10 questions later is what keeps you motivated and trying to get better every day? And it's like, well, my answer is always like, I owe this guitar almost everything good in my life has come from this thing. So it's like, yeah. I owe it all the effort. And uh, plus it also makes me happier than anything else does too. So it's like, why wouldn't yeah. I be doing it every yeah. minute? You know? Yeah. I love that. I love, and you know, and you bring a lot of other people a lot of joy through it. So, you know, it's like, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's the, uh, that's, that's what you're creating as well. Certainly something that, that feels good, that you're calling, that you're connected to, but also it, it like makes people's gardens greener, you know, it makes it, yeah. it makes things yeah. grow. Nice. That's yeah. a good way, good way of thinking of it. Okay. So you graduate from high school, you, you putting records out on your own, you're, you start to play with Jeff, by the way, how did, I mean, I'm assuming someone introduced you to Jeff, but I don't actually know the story. How did that happen? So it was it was really wild. Like I, I started, you know, I started doing these gigs. I'd signed with this with this label. We'd made a sort of started making a record. They were recording things when I didn't know it was being recorded. You know, whatever. But you know, we've all been through this. So um, sure. you know, but uh, but you know, it was really cool. I'm sort of digging in, and, and I I become fr uh, friendly for a period of a couple of years with with my buddy Corey. Uh, Corey Myluck, who's an extraordinary photographer in Toronto, and he's a major guitar nerd like us, like one of the guys, you know. And he had, for years, I'm, I'm talking a little bit about Corey because he's such an important person in my life and someone I love a lot, him and his wife. And, um, you know, we just hit it off. Like, he came to a show once, and I think he introduced himself. I, I had a box wall on pedal, and he goes, oh, man, you know, I've, I've got this cool old picture Clyde. You know, we should hang sometime. He was just the sweetest guy. And... Um, we've been friends for, for years ever since, but it, it turns out that he, um, was on the scene through the eighties and was tight with Jeff and he used to, I don't know if it's fair to say he managed Jeff, but he actually kind of, he took care of Jeff prior to him having, you know, the management that, that, that took him on. So, um, so Corey introduced, I guess he told Jeff about me, he said, you know, there's a guy that really loves you and he's out playing and we should go see him sometime. So. You know, one night Jeff showed up at the gig and I didn't know he was there. And everybody started like making a lot of noise in the room. And I was like, wow, this is a good gig, you know, like what's going on? And then they said, Jeff was here. And uh, so, you know, and then I ran into Jeff a little bit later in this area of Toronto called Kensington Market. We ended up sitting in together in a club. Someone's band was playing and he grabbed the bass. He said, dude, you play guitar. Let's let's go. And I almost feel like he was wanting to see like if I would crack or if I would go for it because, you know, Jeff was, Jeff was somebody who was really uh, as cool and as much fun as he was to hang around when it was playing time, it got really fucking serious. Like it got really serious, really fast and uh, like scary really fast. And so anyway, long story short, I'll come back around, but Corey, you know, talked to Jeff, we, we had met. And then after that jam, Corey, uh, Jeff just said to me, he goes, Hey man, I really like what you're doing. I think you, I, I'd like for you to join my band and we're going to groom you. We're going to teach you and then like, teach you how to play on bigger stages, teach you how to do it. And then we're going to send you out on your own. How does that sound? And I was just like, whoa, like I still remember the moment, you know, and, I, and it was, he was just a, uh, the most generous, beautiful uh, mentor you could ask for. And the guy I've never felt or heard anything like that from anybody playing. It's great. It was crazy. It was crazy. Man. Well, the self-awareness to, to like know that that's what not just uh, I want to hire you in my band to help my show or help my band sound the way or whatever, you know, what to I want to do this to help you give you some experience, 
give you some you know some uh you know practical application whatever and then send you back out into the world a better musician and artist it's like man that who would do that <laughs> yeah i mean really and, and he he was real about it he he definitely mentored some other artists uh in the toronto area and different genres of music and you know he really cared about the music he just wanted to, he just wanted to have fun and and uh you know, he, he, uh, a heart of gold, you know, it's a special guy. Man. I, I mean, like most, I, I think the first time I saw him was, I don't think it was roadhouse. I think it was on MTV, you know, and, and, uh, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't understand what I was seeing. I was like, how is that guy playing guitar like that? It you know, blew me away, of yeah. course. And then I remember seeing him jam with Stevie on, was it night music or whatever, or, or something like that? No, that was with Robin. Uh, what did he jam on TV with Stevie on? I can't remember. Oh, they did a show in Toronto that was, um, that I can't remember the name of the show, but I know they did like Look a Little Sister or something like that. Yeah, someone gave me a VHS of that, and I remember seeing that and thinking, and I remember Stevie mentioning him in guitar magazines, too. He would mention Jeff Healy, and I think that's how I ended up buying the first record. Uh, blew me away. <laughs> yeah, he's, he was, uh, yeah, he was a special guy, you know, and, uh, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, I think when I think back on, on some of those times and some of the things that he played, you know, it's like an out of body experience for me. I'm standing two feet away from him and he'd just be playing something that it kind of puts you in a trance. You know, you have to pay attention to where you were or you, you forgot, you know, and we, you know, we've all played with cats when they're doing that. And it's just like, Whoa, wait, what song work here? We have what song am I? Cause that was so heavy. I've just got, you know, so, yeah. you know, and, and he gave me a lot of time to play stuff that I probably had no business playing on his stage, but he gave me room and he had patience and he stretched the shit out of me. So I'm thankful for that. Yeah, man, that's, that's really amazing, you know, and to be able to, you know, jump to a tour that's like, you know, a proper tour and a bus and things like that and start to learn like the real ropes of being a, a professional on that level you know, that stuff's so invaluable to like the future, your future in this business, like not even just the music side of it. It's, you, you know, you need that. It's, it, it's so, so valuable. I totally agree with you. And I think that there's, there's, but there is no handbook, right. Of like, I think no. you mentioned something really important a minute ago, like, you know, you don't, you're not late for a lobby call. You're not late for sound check. You are there when they tell you, if you're working for someone else, like it's not about you. It's not your stage. You're a guest on this stage. These people paid seats not to see, you, you know, me, I'm here to back up Jack, like do yeah. my job, do not forget that. And, and that's like, when I see footage of Eric Clapton, for instance, jamming with uh, George Harrison or whoever he's playing with, Bob Dylan, he's always hanging in the back, always. And then mm -hmm. he takes a solo, he takes a couple, like maybe a couple steps out and plays a little bit, but then he goes back and he stays back. And I always, my dad, I remember him saying like, you know, remember that you got to be a good guest when you're on somebody else's stage. Just, you know, keep over, keep over, unless they invite you to go and do your thing, but otherwise just, yeah. you know, and, and, and so that was really the way I approached it with Jeff. I was just grateful. I wanted to learn. It's like, how do you do that? I don't know, but you know. Yeah. Yeah. well, that leads us to some of this next stuff. Cause you and I, I think actually have a pretty similar path that I'm not sure many guys can hundred percent relate to. So we started doing our own thing, putting out records, playing our own music on the road. And then we moved to LA and start playing sideman gigs while still sometimes doing some of our own stuff, but like making a living playing with other people where nobody cares what your name is or what you do or what you've done in the past. But it's also, it's a whole new set of skills and experiences. It makes you a better musician. But yeah, your thing kind of gets pushed away. And then I think both of us also have now swung it back around all the way to where we mostly do our own thing again all the time. And I don't think a lot of guys can, can somewhat relate to that. What made you make the decision to flip the page there when you did move here and start playing with other people and kind of, you know, not give up on your thing, but maybe put it on the back burner a little bit? Yeah. So thanks for asking, Josh. And I think that, you know, that's a really, you know, interesting perspective. I think certainly that we both share and, and experiences and all that. And, you know, I, for me, you know, I just kept running into a ceiling and in Canada, there was no room. Uh, there wasn't really a lot of room for me to do what I needed to do. And so I'd be out on the road with Jeff and we toured the world and you would see there was a global audience for this kind of music. And, you know, I was meeting people and having opportunities come up and, and, 
then I would come to Canada and they'd be like, yeah, we're not interested in like blues rock. We don't, you know, it's just not what people care about here. And so at a certain point, I just was like, man, this is just like, you know, if we're hitting a ceiling here. This is like not, this is not going to be sustainable. So my wife and I, you know, just got in the car. My wife and I went to, we went to high school together. We both grew up in Toronto. And so we moved to Los Angeles and, um, you know, her work, it was better for her work too. She's a marine scientist. And, and so, um, she works in that a lot in that area and she has her own company. And so, you know, for me, it was just, there was more opportunities. I knew a couple of producers here that had invited me to come down and, uh, one of the guys was Marty Fredrickson, who we had written uh, some songs together, and he was real cool. Uh, another guy was Mike Bradford, and Mike Bradford is a producer who worked with Kid Rock and that whole camp. And so we had done something. Um, I had been offered something by Atlantic at the time, and my manager was like, I don't like the deal. Let's keep looking. So uh, whatever. So we were hanging. Mike Bradford and I made some songs, and um, he called me and said, listen, man, Uncle Cracker needs a cat that can play and sing. Um, I know you're doing your own thing, but you know, you just got to LA, you got to pay the rent. You want to do it? And I'm like, yeah. So he ended up having this huge song, right? This drift away. And it was like, it was such a totally weird, like pop mainstream experience. Not that crack your uncle crack was pop music, but it fit in that area. So that was a huge learning experience. I did that for about a year and a half. I mean, as you said, just moved here, got to try to find some work and then, um, that led to, um, one day meeting John Shanks and, and then he just said, you know, Melissa's looking for a dude. And I was like, Oh, okay. Well, Melissa, again, the reason I took it is because I have so much certainly gratitude to be considered, but because I admire Melissa so much, she's such a phenomenal artist. I mean, all the way around, all the way around. So again, much like with Jeff, she's a real mentor to me. So I took that opportunity to try to learn and grow and she gave me so much room and stretched I mean she is such a great mentor and at a certain point it was you know like with Jeff he just one day Jeff said to me he goes dude I think I think it's time to jump out of the nest and it came to a similar place with Melissa where it was like I know you got your own thing to do buddy like you know and and I mean this in the best way possible but you know whether you're a lawyer or, a, or whatever job you have and if you you're in a situation where you're getting paid well or enough to keep the lights on and pay the rent or whatever you know i've had friends refer to it a bit as golden handcuffs because you can't just like up and quit like in in this industry what are you going to do like you know it, it's not a for sure thing every two weeks you're getting a paycheck right so um so it's like this mixture of gratitude with a mixture of knowing that i have more to do so um anyway long long way around of saying i always had my own music in my mind but was thankful to have some truly amazing mentors along the way. Oh yeah. I mean, you're right. Golden handcuffs is a good way to put it. It's like, I saw myself jumping from tour to tour and, you know, session to session and being on the road for a year and then not on the road for a year and then on the road for a year and make good money and yeah. then make nothing. And it was like, this could, if, next thing I knew if I blinked, it could be 40 years done. And this is all I've done is right. maybe pay my bills, have good year, bad year, you know, and, and, and then what will be the end result of that? Will I be happy, you know? And so it became, you know what, this is great, but I, I think I'm better served to be doing what really makes me the, the happiest, which is playing my own music, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And I, and that, yeah, it's, it's a tough thing. You mentioned that, you know, like the, the years when it's, when it's good, is fun. The years when it's yeah. quiet is like, Holy shit. You know, it's scary. Yeah. So there's a lot of stress in those years. Yeah. There's a lot of stress in those years. But the experience of doing that work and and doing jobs that aren't necessarily, you know, even if the music is related to what you do, it's not your music. So, you know, there's things you got to learn. There's all this new stuff that comes. It makes your shit, it makes you better at your stuff after you're done with that experience. You just become a much better musician. So I'm grateful for that side of it 100%. Absolutely. I mean, you know, students, you know, on, on the journey and, and, you know, when you get to, when you get to collaborate with somebody who not just out of, out of notoriety, but just out of their passion and, and gifts, it's, it's beautiful to have the, the opportunity to be near it and feel inspired and, and um, yeah, I, I, you know, just really try to sponge whatever you can try to learn. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, dude, before we get into the 10 questions, 
it would be ridiculous if we didn't take a few minutes and just talk about Stevie for a second, uh, because we have to. Um, I'm curious, what's the first song you ever heard? The first Stevie Ray Vaughan song I ever heard was probably Couldn't Stand the Weather. Okay. All right. Nice. Yeah, that was part of a part of something that my dad recorded, which was called Guitar Heroes on Much Music in Canada. And it had all, you know, Eddie Van Halen and all the players and, and Stevie, that was the song. So I remember that. It was the music video with the rain and all that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah of course. I loved it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah man. I, you, did you ever see him play? No, I didn't. Me neither. I, I fucked up. My dad said I was, I mean, I was nine years old, so I don't know how much I really yeah. fucked up, but, but my dad said, hey, hey, Stevie Ray Vaughan and Jeff Beck are playing. Do you want to go? And I said, nah, I'm good. You know, I, I, I didn't even know what I was saying. I don't think, you know, it was like, oh, I, yeah. yeah, I missed that one. Yeah. You know, man, I, I, I you know, I, I want, I, I feel you on that. And, and uh, I mean, of course it, if any of if we could have seen, if we could have actually seen Stevie in person, I think it would have been a, uh, a very, very, very special experience. And, and, uh, I didn't, I didn't get to see him. I wanted to see that tour. I was too young to go on my own because it was in downtown Toronto at the Sky Dome is what it was called at the time. And we were living North of the city. So there's no way I could have gone, you know, I didn't drive yet. You know, I wasn't, yeah. so didn't get to go, but, uh, but yeah, but yeah, we feel him for sure. And when's the first time you saw live at the Elma Combo? Because someone gave me the bootleg of that, and that was the first time I actually saw him playing, really, as opposed to just heard the records. And that, that yeah. was that was the, the watershed for me. Like, that changed my life overnight. Yeah, I'm with you, man. The game changer. I saw it whenever it was released, you know, like, okay. was that early 90s, I think. And it, yeah. because uh, I think I got it on a VHS tape. And I wore out the first one, and then got another one, and then another, one, you know. And it, so <laughs> that's the craziest. That that is just, you know, there's no words. It's nuts. It's next level. <laughs> oh, dude, I tell people all the time, as as ridiculous as the playing is on that tape, because they're so on. And actually, I asked Tommy and Chris about that recently. I was like, did you guys know that that was a really good night? And they both said we actually did know that we killed it that night. So when we heard oh, that the wow. video that they had the video of that, we were like, "Oh, we know that's going to be good. That was really a good night." They remembered it that way. Yeah. Wow, how cool, that's man! That's yeah. That, you know, I, I I spoke to a few people in Toronto who have gone to the show and, and talked about their experience of being there. But yeah, I mean, that that's cool. You got to talk to Chris and Tommy about it. Wow. Oh, dude, that it, it's crazy. So, you know, last year I produced Reese's record with Joe, and so it was that's like right. you know, there were a few there were a few days of me and Joe and Kenny Wayne Shepherd and Tommy, Chris and Reese. And that's it, you know, and we're all hanging around and it's like, I'm being professional doing my job, but also Joe and I would be looking at each other. Could be little moments where they'd be talking to each other and little stories come up, you know, and it was just like, okay, little me is freaking out right now. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah, this is cool. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's, that's one of those ones. Maybe you don't sleep for a few days after that. That's pretty cool. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It was fun yeah. stuff, man. Yeah, All right, man. Dude. Let's get into the 10 questions, shall we? <laughs> uh-oh, uh-oh, I'm nervous, I'm nervous. <laughs> All right. Number one, when you first started playing guitar and learning stuff, what was the first, like, song, chord, lick, whatever, that when you figured it out, you were, like, so proud, you couldn't believe you got this? Like, oh, my God, I can't believe I just figured this out. And, it, you know, that sets the hook forever. You know, I love that question, Josh. It's so cool because that feeling is palpable, right? Like, you, you know that feeling. It's got to be, it's got to be figure like learning sunshine of your love, you know, for the first time. Like, just actually stringing those notes together for the first time and then, like, the light goes off. Like, oh, you know, yeah. I, I think that was, I think that may have been what it was. Yeah, man, that feeling when, when you finally figure out something you've listened to a hundred times and it comes out here, it's like, there's no going back after that. It's over. It, it is absolutely a beautiful, a beautiful experience for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, maybe this answer is number two then. What's the first solo you ever loved so much you had to learn note for note? Okay. First solo I learned... Uh, Yeah, I don't know if I ever, I think I might have tried to learn a lot of stuff, like maybe Crossroads or something. 
but I probably got frustrated because I couldn't, I didn't get there. <laughs> you know, I, I would think it might've been something like Crossroads and, um, you know, again, a lot of Clapton in the house growing up. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, a lot of the firsts may have been connected to him in some way. Um, and uh, obviously, you know, Crossroads is not one that you want to start too early because it's, it's not just the notes. It's, uh, there's yeah. a lot going on in there. <laughs> So your dad, I mean, your parents are from the UK and they're that, that era. Clapton was huge for your dad and, and for sure, right? Yeah, they took me to, my first concert was Clapton uh, with Mark Knopfler on um, second guitar. So that was the first show that, yeah, it was all the time Clapton in the house. Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, that's really cool. All right. What's the first thing you play every time you pick up a guitar? Do your hands just go somewhere on autopilot without thinking? Um, should I play it or no? Just like, yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure. Play uh, it, yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't know. Like today, if I if I did, I'd probably go like. Uh, I don't know, something like that. Like, I don't know if it's coming through or not because this phone sometimes sounds. It's like good. It's... I hear it. Yeah. Huh. Okay. All right. Do you have something? Do you have something that uh, when you try out a guitar? that you do like to, to check and see if this guitar even has what you're looking for, like a little, you know, pet thing that lets you know if a guitar is cool or not. Absolutely. And I love that question. And I, I want to ask if it's okay, I'd love to, I'd love to ask you that question too. Cause sure, yeah. what I usually do is like, if I was in a store and I saw this guitar on the, you know, I'd be like, Oh, cool. I would play it not plugged in. And what I sometimes do is I'll just, just hit like a G chord. And then just feel around the body to see like what's resonating. How is the guitar feeling acoustically? Yeah. Um, because a lot of times, if it feels good to me, just a G chord, you know, it's kind of like okay, I feel it in my tummy. I feel it rumbling. This guitar has got some got something going on. And then you know, oh, okay, you know, I mean, if I didn't like the pickups, you could change them. But I think for me, I want to hear an electric guitar and what is how it's resonating. What? How about for you? No, 100%. I do the same thing. I mean, even before I even take it off the wall, it'll just be like hanging up like this and, you know, in a stand and I'll just strum it and I put my forearm yeah. up against the guitar just to see if I feel anything, you know, through my arm, like any sort of resonance or, you know, vibration. And if it does, cool. then I'll pick it up and then I'll play it unplugged for a while. And then usually wait for that moment where it's like, no, I need to plug this in. It tells me whether I need to plug it in or not. Otherwise, it just goes back on the wall. You know? I love it. I love it. I, I totally, totally hear you on that. Yeah, I like the forearm trick. That's cool. Maybe that's like COVID friendly. <laughs> it's very COVID friendly. Yes. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Number four. What key, style, groove, uh, whatever, vibe, do you have like playing in your head? Is there, is there something that just like lives there a narration as you're driving the car or, you know, cooking breakfast or whatever? I'm hearing a shuffle all the time. Like I can't help it. I'm always hearing something swinging, you know, and, and some improv going over the top of it. It literally never goes yeah. away. Do you have something yeah. like that? You know, I, I usually like to like to gravitate towards something maybe a little bit funky, you know, a little bit funky, like, uh, um, I used to like the, the way a lot like Chris Duarte would do some of the stuff off his first record where, you know, um, you know, it was kind of like. The... You know, that kind of thing, when, you know, yeah. like just boogieing along. I don't know. <laughs> it's funny, man. You just brought up that Chris Duarte first record. I just went back and revisited that record recently. Because yeah. um, I, I think I may be involved in, in helping him make his next record. So he sent me some tunes oh, cool. to listen to. Wow. And uh, I was listening to his new tunes. And I thought, let me go back and listen to the first record and see what it was that, that turned me on and what was the, you know, the coolest thing about that. And it was a lot of those type, the, the way he played Big Leg Legged Woman, or even that tune in C that was just an instrumental. Da -da -da, boom, da -da -da -da, the C butt rock, yeah. whatever he called it. Yeah. Yeah. But rock, you're right. Yeah. 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 There we go. There's, yeah. There's some amazing, like some of the stuff, I mean, just, just quickly, not to, not to get too far away from here, but man, I saw Chris on that tour and he was nuts. That's, he was oh, yeah. unbelievable. I saw him come into the musicians exchange, which is the club. My, was like my home club in Fort Lauderdale. 
with you know the two stacks, so two heads, two vibroverbs in the middle, two four twelves. He was wearing a red GHS boomer shirt with the sleeves cut off and some zebra like sweatpants, you know, and he rolled around the yeah. stage and he was the loudest thing I'd ever heard in my life, and I thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. <laughs> yeah, he's he is tr- just a ferocious man. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Wow. Nice, man. Uh as an addendum to that question, do you ever pay attention to like when when a piece of music comes on you've never listened to like in the car or something what's where your where your mind goes first do you start like improving over the top of it do you start like singing harmony with the the vocals do you start focusing in on the groove do, do you notice that ever yeah that's a great question you know a lot of times i'll listen to if if, if, if i'm hearing something for the first time and i don't know why but i like it you know or, or it's keeping me intrigued let's say i don't even know if i like it yet but um, a lot of times I, I want to see what, the, what I'm feeling through the changes in the melody. So through the chord changes and through whatever, if, it's, if it is a, a vocalist involved, you know, just sort of like what the, what the picture that's being painted. But a lot of times, um, and this is similar for like when songwriting, a lot of it will sort of come from like what moods sort of come up from the way the changes are moving. I don't know if that makes sense, so that's too vague, but... Um, you know, um, absolutely. I mean, you know, diatonic changes that they, 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 they exist for a reason. It's like when you hear a movement of this interval to that interval, it's like it makes you feel a certain way because of the back history of music that you've heard that's done that and the way that those things make you feel. So, yeah, I get it 100 percent. Yeah, that or, you know, I mean, like, look at Lick My Love Pump. What is that, D minor? Is that the saddest key, right? <laughs> the saddest key think, of all time. <laughs> you know, I I tried to, I was going to put on a little Spinal Tap the other day. I was feeling a little a little sad. We got a little coronavirus blues, so I was going to put it on. I think after this year, we might all need a, a dose of some Spinal Tap, man. <laughs> yeah, that's a beautiful piece. What did, what did he say? It's, a, it's kind of in between Mozart and Bach. It's like a mock piece. <laughs> It's yeah. It's I mean, it's still funny. I don't know how but it's still. Funny. Oh, it doesn't matter how many times I see it. I still crack my son. It he doesn't he doesn't get it. He's like, this is funny to you. I'm like, this is the greatest. You know. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. <laughs> All right. Number five. When did you feel like maybe you started to find your lane or your voice on the instrument because you know we all come up obsessed with all these people and we learn all this stuff and yeah we we start to like squeeze them down into into our thing and you know and they're always but they're always peeking out Uh, is there a moment that you can remember where it was like a conscious choice or or when you just remember feeling like hey i started to hint on something that maybe will be my thing i'm going to go further that way yeah, again, Josh, such such thoughtful, you know, such thoughtful questions and conversation. You know, I I think my first answer is that it's a continue it's a continued work in progress, right? It's a continued, um, you know, every day I'm trying to figure out how I can become a better person, and, uh, more connected, um, and and in a lot of ways, I feel like that that really reflects through the music, and it's part of the you know the lifelong commitment I think to really trying to grow certainly as an artist but first and foremost as a person because i think the more that the more that i can do that and the more that i can learn to, to be kind to myself and 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 really um maybe show some of the love toward myself that i'm really eager to show to other people you know like um some of the things that you know maybe i didn't learn about right away so some of these things that, that i am working on in my life and and i am seeing that directly reflect the music and the writing and the expression and what like what comes out and it feels more open so i would say it again I, I may not be totally nailing your question right on but i think it's sort of like it's part of the better that i can treat myself the more that i'm going to be able to find uh more than i'm going to be able to find what it is that that i'm looking for and it's a lifelong journey so i'm getting kind of like out there but but it, it's it's part of the lifelong commitment to it oh yeah no it's totally a lifelong journey And I don't think you ever actually arrive. It's more like being cognizant of the fact that it needs to happen and not not like feeling like I did it. You know what I mean? It's just more like you're going there. Yeah. Right. 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 Absolutely. So, you know, I mean, I think I think, you know, really a lot of it maybe comes from just trying to be as as open and as, you know, as uh, uninfluenced by what somebody else thinks they should or shouldn't do in a a recording. I think it's, if I'm recording something, I feel really free and I really, whether it's angry or happy or anything in between, that's when I really feel like most myself. If I just, 
I don't care what anybody else thinks. This is how I feel right now. And this is what's coming out of the music. That's when I feel the most like myself. Nice. All right. I could dig it. Number six. What do you consider your biggest weakness on the guitar? Uh, where do I start? Um, I would say, you know, just, just the fact that I really don't find theory um, very exciting. You know, really, I'm just I'm more of a self-taught player, I'm more of an ear player. Um, and I think, you know, in some circumstances that may not be, that may not necessarily set me up for the easiest, uh, you know, whatever it is, recording, if someone's, everyone's busting out charts, and I'm like, what's that? You know, but at the same time, um, I also know myself, it's not, it's not about being intentionally ignorant. I think it's that, as I was sharing earlier, you know, I spent a lot of time in that world and it really turned me off from music. So I think in some ways it's like respecting it and also respecting, you know, what it is that, uh, you know, the way, the way that I like to approach music. And so maybe it's a little bit archaic at the same time, but I kind of like that. I need it to be a little bit that way. Um, so that, you know, I'm not thinking. I just, again, for me, when I start thinking too much, it takes the fun out of it. I want to feel it. So, um, okay. but that's just for me. No judgment on anybody else, you know. Where everybody so does their own thing. So is that a weakness then or just a choice? You know, I think, I, I think it's, well, you know, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a lack of, it's a lack of knowledge in that area. So I would say that it could be perceived as a weakness in some ways, you know. Um, but again, it's also, a, it's also somewhat of a decision. So, um, yeah. you know, I mean, I could, I could pull up another one, <laughs> pull up another weakness because <laughs> it's fun. I love, I love talking about them because no, it's just it's always, always interesting stuff. to me because guys, there's nothing wrong with like being, uh, you know, content, not content, but like knowing what you like and, and, and the way you want to approach things. I don't, you know, it's like it. it I understand like, okay, if you don't know something and it's holding you back, then it's a problem. Like if there's something holding you back from accomplishing the goal you want to accomplish, shit, you got a problem. You got to solve that. But if it's not, is it, a, you know what I mean? It's weird. It's, it's, it's like a balance of, is it really holding me back or not? I guess is the, is the decision needs to be made. Yeah. And it probably also depends specifically on the, on the circumstance as well. Right. What, what the situation is, um, you know, one of the things um, that, I, that I have learned that I think is really important to talk about um, that pops up, it's not necessarily a weakness, but it's, it's physical stuff. And I think something that I did learn um, is learning to listen to your body when you're playing big strings and you're bending. Um, and not a lot of people think that, you know, uh, that that makes you strong and badass because you're playing with big strings. Well, in some ways it does. At the same time, if you hurt yourself and you can't play anymore, you know, that's, that's a real problem. So um, at, at, at one point, you know, I, I really like to use 11s, 12s, 13s all the time and at standard pitch. And after a while trying to do two and a half step bends, you, you start to realize that you're really hurting yourself for the long term. And um, so, again, not necessarily talking about it as a weakness, but I think it can be a weakness if you – if you sort of gauge how strong you are, how good you are based on your string gauge. So maybe that's something, you know, with, with some learning and growth around that. And, you know, I know you use a lot of heavy, like real heavy strings. So, well, know. dude, yeah, but it's, you're right. Like that listening to your body thing. Like, so, so yeah, I've used 13 to 58 standard pitch on every guitar since I, since I was 15. Like, that's just what I use is what I'm used to. It's on every guitar here. And, but yeah, if I go a couple days without playing, I feel it, you know, and I've been, you know, whatever, let me knock on wood. I've never had any hand problems yet, but there have been like weird moments where like for a day, like, well, that doesn't feel right, you know, or this or that. And and you freak out because you think you've, you've done something wrong, a rever you know, a irrevocable damage from playing these strings for so long, you know, and I worry right. about that. Uh, you know, and, and I've had people ask me, well, what happens if, if, you know, you can't do it anymore? Will you go down lighter gauges? Or are you going to be too proud? I'm like, fuck no. Like if I can't play anymore, I'm going to go down in gauges. I, it's uh, the playing is more important than what strings are on the guitar. <laughs> exactly. But, but, you know, you've got really strong hands. So if that's, what's comfortable to you right now. That's what's comfortable, right? It's like, you right. know, yeah, to me, it, it just feels normal, but it's because 
I've done it so long that it's just, it, you know, it's the same as, as somebody else picking up tens. It's the same to them. You know, I've built up that, that strength and, and the familiarity with it. So it, it doesn't feel like anything out of the ordinary to me. Right, 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 right. Yeah. 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 Do it, um, what are you using now? Like, what do you got on there? I use a, usually use about anywhere from 12 to 54 or 56, or I'll use 11 to 54. Right now I've got 11 to 54 on here. So, you tuned, uh, are you tuned down a half step? Yeah, tuned down a half step. You always yeah. tune down a half step? You know, when I'm doing my own stuff, I do. I love where it sits vocally. Uh, certainly when you're singing an E and you want to try to get up to like a B, you know, the B or, you know, it's like, yeah. uh, well, you know, all those, try to get those. If it's, if it's a little too high, blow it out. So, so the E flat's nice. Tuning to D is actually awesome when you're on the road and your voice is fried and it's like, oh, wait, okay, we got a couple more gigs in the tank. <laughs> yeah. I actually like the way s tuning to D sounds better than E flat normally. I, it's something, I love the, the growl that, tuning to diaz i'm with you man yeah it's it's large and in charge e flat is tough for me because i've grown up playing along to so many guitar players tuned down to e flat but i never did that it's like it's yeah. a weird i have this weird thing with e yeah it's i've never been able to really get wrap my head around tuning down on the regular it always messes me up well it sounds it, it sounds like whatever you're doing is working pretty well so you don't have to worry about it well i'll try yeah yeah all right, number seven. Who's a huge influence on your guitar playing that maybe people would be surprised to hear? Um, that's a great question. Somebody who's a huge influence. Uh, well, there's a couple names that popped in my head right away. It would be Mark Knopfler. Mm -hmm. um, Mark Knopfler and uh, Coco Montoya. Uh, both nice. those are two or those are two of my, I would say, like, just for different reasons, but I love them both very, very much. Nice. Yeah. So did you see Coco when you were, when you were a kid? Like, was that something you saw with John or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. We used to go and see, um, when he was with John Mayall, uh, Walter Trout was not with him at the time, but it was Coco. I think might've even been the only player when I saw them. Um, and they would be on bills with like Otis Rush or Buddy Guy at the time, you know? And, and so, you know, I, I used to go and try to see all those shows and, um, so Buddy might have been headlining, but John Mayall would be out there. And Coco, during that time, I swear, was like, without question, in the top top five electric blues players I've ever seen. I mean, it was it was terrifying. Like, there would be a – we saw one show was at Ontario Place. I think it was like – you could do 10,000 people there. It was like one of those rotating stages, outdoor thing. I'll never forget that show. He was so far away, but, you know, obviously guitar this way. And the whole, all I remember is a whole guitar when he was doing, just grabbing notes, shaking. It was, it was so great. Yeah, I, I vividly remember seeing him with John in the same time period, and he had that red knob, dual professional or whatever it was, Fender Twin Head, and the carpeted yeah. 412 cabinet, you know, Fender 412, and that, that white Strat, you know, with the Bill Lawrences or whatever in there. I don't think there were Bardens then, but uh, – yeah, he just and he would do that bit where he would make the guitar cry and talk like kind of yeah. like Albert Collins, but he would do it with the volume knob too, and it was just like, oh, this guy's so killer. Yeah, 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 and I love that you mentioned the Albert Collins piece because yeah, he could like pull out an Albert influence type thing when you're least expecting it and just like knock you over. He is, and he's just such a nice guy. One of the nicest I've ever in this business. One of the nicest ever to come across. Like, stays in touch for life becomes a friend like just such a great dude yeah oh yeah i agree nice guy cool man well if you guys don't know coco montoya pick up some of his albums Maybe. yes please spread the word yeah all right number eight in a gig situation would you rather have a great guitar and a shitty amp or vice versa a great amp and a crappy guitar um well i think it's got to be a great guitar and the not so great amp, I think, is is really it. Um, because most flying dates are the not so good amp, and your guitar, and you just, I'm gonna hold this guitar. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, the uh, the flying rigs usually make it a couple songs, and then that's it. So yeah, a good a good guitar. How about you? I, I'm the other way. I'm the amp way. I, I'm just 
I know that the show will be better if I have the headroom and at least the bass tone that I need and whatever guitar as opposed to vice versa. Like if I have to play my guitar and pedals through like, you know, something with no headroom and no reverb and just a terrible amp, I'm going to struggle that night. And it'll mean that the audience won't enjoy the show as much. I I hear you, man. Sometimes, sometimes you just got to pretend that that amp is killing it when it's not, <laughs> it's yeah. like, you know, like a, a, rent, a, a broken, <laughs> sorry, a, how many broken rental twins can you find yeah. out there? Like all of them? <laughs> we <laughs> seem to find all of them because they show up at every fucking gig. Yeah. It's yeah. Funny. They, they do. They, it's yeah. funny, but you know, when they work, it's great. But with, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm always curious how every silver face fender ever made ended up in Europe. And backline companies. I don't know how they ended up. I, I, yeah. <laughs> and they're all broken. All the master they're, volume ones. They're all master volume, silver face, twins, supers, pros, broken. Like, see, and they roll them out there in this road case. It looks like it's from 1972. They never let you take it out of the fucking tray. It sounds horrible. Yeah. Oh, it drives me crazy. Drive and, and, and then you get this. Then you get, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome guitar wizard Josh Smith. <laughs> and you're trying what the like i can't you know it's like ah yep <laughs> yeah and everybody there is going to comment on your tone you know and it's like you're playing in your tone and it's like oh great it, yeah it's funny yeah you know i, I i'll share we, we made a, a live ep about a couple of years ago it's called uh, scorched earth and that was done on rental amps pointed at the wall like turn around backwards pointed in a corner with a big yeah. yeah, it was it was it was hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that and that became now what you send out into the world. It's just like when on YouTube, for some reason, the video that all of a sudden a million people watch and it gets gets hit a lot is that one where you're playing through a Marshall valve state on a situation <laughs> where you didn't even want to be there. You know what I mean? And it's like you're, you're, you know, yeah, that's the one that now that forever is the one people share and talk to you about. That's right. Oh, dude, you're a solid state guy. I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Number nine. We touched on this talking earlier, but what keeps you pushing forward to be better tomorrow than you are today? What keeps you just like, you know, working on bettering your craft? You know, I think it's the it's it's the eternal commitment and under, well, first of all, eternal understanding, I'm an, an eternal student. And, you know, what I'm here is to do the very best that I can to share, you know, love through, love through my soul and spirit and through the vehicle of music in the best way that I can. And so, um, you know, I think it, it really comes back to, you know, what we were talking about a minute ago, the best that I can take care of myself and, and really have good boundaries with unsafe people or, or you know, whatever it is, whether it's in business or personal life. Um, you know, I think the more that I can do to, to, to take care of myself and be careful um, and listen to my gut, uh, you know, the more room there is for growth. And through that, it, it's, it excites me. There's more opportunity for growth in, in life. And I think as I was saying, the more that I can open up my spirit and my mind and my, my soul to learn in this journey of life, it will directly influence the music. It will directly influence um, even what my perception is of what I think getting better is because it could be way beyond what I, like, I don't want to limit myself with, you know, Oh, I want to try to figure out this crazy thing. It's like, no, no, it's, it, it's something that I think involves my entire life. And so, uh, as much as I want to improve myself as a person, I would like to improve myself as a, as a writer, as a singer, as a, as a, as a musician, as a player. And, um, so that's, that's a constant work in progress. And I think also, Anytime I hear Albert Collins or Freddie King or Stevie Ray or Jeff Healy or, or Coco Montoya or, or Ian Moore or Chris Duarte or Doyle or, you know, any of these players, it's just like, yeah, there's work to be done. So I got to get back to it. Yeah. That's a uh, very grounded uh, outlook there, my friend. <laughs> well, just trying, man. Just trying. <laughs> nice, man. Just trying. All right. Number 10, then, to bookend that and to bookend it all, where do you see yourself in five years? Do you have a five-year plan? Is that stuff you worry about? Do you, do you make goals for yourself, things you really want to accomplish, or is it let me just continue on this journey I'm on and see what happens? Where do you see yourself five years from now? 
Yeah, thanks, Josh. I think both are true. You know, I think, again, like in some ways, I would hate to limit myself by saying, I want it to look like this, you know, I want this, but it could be so much more, right? So I am open, I'm open to the possibilities. And at the same time, you know, I'm extremely grateful for what I have in this moment. I want to stay in this moment where I am. And again, try to stay rooted to, to, to gratitude, rooted to, to the fact that, um, you know, what I'm learning today is different from what I was learning yesterday. And I got to just, you know, keep working on it and, um, you know, hopefully writing better songs, singing, you know, all of it. It's just, I think, continuing to invest in the growth. And I don't know what it's going to look exactly like yet. Um, but, you know, I have dreams. I have aspirations. Sure. You know, I'd like to reach as many people as I can through music and, and try to leave, you know, try to leave something positive while I have time on the earth because it's a privilege to make music, uh, it, you know, for me in my lifetime. So I think just continuing to continue to respect it and um, and try to, you know, yeah, approach it with gratitude. Nice, man. Well, uh, you can't ask for more than that. I mean, that's a good, healthy attitude and outlook on life. So, dude, thank you for doing this. It's been a pleasure to uh, talk to you. Uh, and thank you for taking the time out of your day. Uh, for the rulers, we're going to come back and do the turn two. But if you're not a ruler, please hit join here or at least please subscribe to the channel because it will keep my effort level up. And I will continue to create this content while I'm home with nothing else to do. Uh, but, dude. Thank you for doing this. Uh, I, I just appreciate you taking the time. And like I said, we need to hang, man. We need to get together. Yeah. Yeah, we do need to do that. I, I look forward to that. And, you know, Josh, thank you so much for the invitation and for taking the time to have me on here as well. And, uh, yeah, love, you know, love everything that you're, that you're working on, man. All the great music and the artists that you're working with. I mean, you're making, making some fiery, amazing music there. Thanks, man. I, I appreciate that. All right. And there'll be links oh, to – Oh, thanks, dude. There'll be there'll be links to all of Philip's music and stuff in the body of this video. So please support him. This is how he will continue to do his thing and live his journey is by you listening to his music. So please do that. And uh, rulers, hang on. We'll be right back.